see backup information to detail where they, how, how the um, draft rate was determined. Uh, there will be a period of time to be able for an institution to challenge the draft rate. Once that expires, you have the opportunity to. Um, uh, well, once that expires, then and and once final rates are issued, um, there is a further opportunity to uh, file an appeal based upon alternate earning, sur an alternate earning survey if. The institution has um, performed that and with the required documentation. Uh, in January of 2017, there will be new disclosure requirements imposed um, that are in the final rule but don't take effect until then. This, this slide really just shows that process um, that I just described. And um, I don't believe it adds anything new to what I said. <clears throat> um, so in the overview of the uh, um, gainful employment reporting, um, you know, the institution has to determine all the students who enrolled in the program during the reporting period. Uh, you're going to be providing information uh, on, on all students, not just the completers who were enrolled. And, and like um, in several other areas, the department is collecting uh, more information than they actually need to, to calculate the metrics. And um, they, I don't, they haven't truly really explained, uh, to my knowledge, you know, why they're collecting all of this information. But um, the requirement is to determine all the students who enrolled in the program, uh, submit the data on Title IV aid recipients only, um, and only as to gainful employment programs which existed, which are existing as reflected on your ECAR as of July 1st, 2015. Um, this slide talks about uh, what a GE program is. I mean, we're, we're beyond, we're, we're, this slide go, assumes everyone here understands that if you are a proprietary institution, <clears throat> you're going to be, all, all of your programs, degree and non-degree, will um, most likely be gainful employment programs, or uh, there is a, uh, one very narrow exception. Um, and if you you are a non-profit institution or a public institution, then the GE program definition will apply to the non-degree programs. Um, but within that, drilling down a bit, uh, there are some further clarifications. So the, the, one of the essential points of analysis is the OPE number. Um, the so a so a program uh, that that you might be offering, which is at multiple uh, institutions with different OPE numbers, is going to be treated as a separate GE program by OPE number. Um, the if the six-digit OPE number and the credential level, for example, certificate. Um, and the six-digit SIP code are the same, uh, and speaking within one OPE number, then it'll be treated as one program. So if you have a, a, uh, an, an institution with a main location and multiple additional locations all under one OPE number, <clears throat> but all the same credential level and same SIP code, they will all be treated, they'll be combined as one program. Um, a separate disclosure template is required for the same program offered at differing lengths, however. Uh, programs at different credential levels, but with the same SIP code, are treated as different programs. 
different GE programs and programs with the same credential level uh, but different SIP codes are also treated as different GE programs. Uh, we have a note here, um, yeah, just go back for one second, with regard to um, updating your, your eCar within 10 days uh, for any of these items uh, listed below, which includes uh, a change in the SIP code. And I think, Steve, you take over from here, I believe. Happy to do so, Peter. Um, when it gets time to do your gainful employment reporting, what you're reporting is information that's in connection with uh, periods of enrollment that your students have in GE programs. And as Peter said, you know, just back on slide seven, it's only with respect to students who were Title IV recipients uh, in the award years that you're reporting. So only Title IV students. Um, but it is focused on periods of enrollment, not just you know, student by student, which means that a student who happens to be enrolled in multiple GE programs during the same award year is going to have two different entries. Um, also, you know, any student who is enrolled, uh, withdraws, and then re-enrolls again in the same program uh, during the same award year is going to have you know multiple entries for each one of those periods of enrollment. And you know finally, you know a student who's enrolled in, in a GE program that covers multiple award years is going to be reported separately for each one of those award years. Uh, this slide here um, is just a visual aid to help you see uh, how this would work in NSLDS. You've got the student. Alex Jones, here's uh, award year 08 and 09, and you can see he was enrolled in this program for that award year. Uh, the following year, uh, he's still in the same program, so he gets another line that's entered and shows a, uh, a status of withdrawn. So just, just to point out that you're doing this um, based on what the student's en enrollment was, you know, not just uh, the student's identity. There are uh, multiple categories of information that you're providing related to these periods of enrollment. Uh, first is, uh, on this slide, institutional data. That will show uh, your institution's OPE ID number, um, as well as the eight-digit number, so it's going to be specific down to you know, the site, as well as your name. Uh, it's going to contain GE program information, showing the, the program's name, uh, the award year uh, and the SIP code, the six-digit uh, SIP code, and it, you know, we've got a key point here. Make sure that uh, the SIP code that you're using for reporting purposes is from uh, the, the SIP code uh, 2010 vintage. About every 10 years or so, uh, NCES uh, redoes the SIP code classifications, and in 2010, the uh, codes that they used were a little bit different in some cases from uh, what they had used in 2000. So if you have old 2000 codes, they might not be the right ones for your program anymore. Uh, this slide uh, shows a, uh, a question and answer uh, that was posted to the department's uh, IFAP website uh, that basically uh, uh, makes a point that if you are an institution, perhaps because you had a, uh, a merger or a combination or you acquired uh, another site and changed its designation, uh, you may have had uh, two different OPIDs during this reporting period. Uh, the, if that's you, the department wants you to use your current OPID to report you know, the GE program for every single year that's reporting. So even if in 2008-09 you were actually a different OPID number, they want to use your current one. Uh, the third category of information that is part of the GE program uh, reporting is uh, this program level information. Uh, actually, <coughs> we're still on category two, my apologies. Uh, in addition to uh, the GE program name and SIP code classification, you're also going to be telling the department what is the credential level. Uh, you're going to be basically answering a yes or no question as to whether or not your program offers a medical or dental internship or residency. Uh, you're going to be telling the department, you know, what is the length of your program uh, based on the, you know, published length in weeks, months, or years that you put in your catalog. 
And you're also going to tell the department what unit of measurement that is based on, you know, semester credit hours, quarter credit hours, uh, clock hours. Um, and, you know, that can be expressed also in, in duration for weeks, months, or years. Uh, next, you're going to have a, a category based on student data. This is going to be the probably the largest category of information uh, that is you know, particular to the student. It will include the student's social security number, uh, the student's complete name and date of birth. These are the uh, these four data points are, are what the department's going to ultimately use to uh, go get earnings, uh, mean and median information for the cohort of completers it uses when it is calculating those debt to earnings ratios Peter talked about at the beginning of the presentation. So, uh, you know, this element is obviously vital uh, to you know, that process. Uh, additionally, you're going to be telling the department uh, the student's enrollment status as of the first day of enrollment in the program, meaning, you know, were they full-time, three-quarter time, half-time, or less than half-time. You're going to be telling the department what uh, date the student began enrollment in your, in your program. And, you know, th this might be a date that, uh, precedes uh, the award year that you're first uh, reporting for the student. And, and that might be because the student in 2008-2009 wasn't a Title IV recipient until the following year, 9-10. Uh, well, when you start to do your reporting for 9-10, you're going to have a program begin date uh, with a, uh, that, that would have fallen in the previous year, you know, 08-09. Uh, you're also going to be telling uh, the department what, uh, what the attendance beginning date was for that student in the award year that you're reporting. So it's the begin date for the program itself and the begin date for the award year that you're reporting, two different dates. Uh, you'll be telling the department what the program um, uh, attendance status for the student was as of you know, June 30 of your award year. Did the student graduate? Yeah. Graduate? Did they withdraw? Uh, or were they just still enrolled. Uh, you're going to be telling the department uh, also what the program attendance status date was. So if there was a, uh, a fixed point at which the student graduated, that's, you know, the date that you would put in as a, as a status date. Uh, if you had a, uh, a withdrawal date, uh, the same thing. If you have that student I mentioned before who's still enrolled, hasn't finished the program, still uh, an active uh, student, then you would just put June 30 uh, in uh, as uh, the attendance status date. So um, picking up on uh, on that, uh, and we're going to we'll go through a few um, Q and A's that the department published um, on their IFAP web page. But you know, the, this question here was. What if the um, school does not retain or possess uh, in its documents uh, um, the student's enrollment status as of the beginning of the enrollment in that program, but rather has a, a later date, in this case, uh, the end of the add drop period? Um, and the answer there is to use the, the information you have uh, and, and use that later date. Um, the next. Um, Q and A related to, you know, how do you how to deal with reporting students who are enrolled um, in a summer term that crosses award years, um, and the basic answer here is that you know if the, um, you know, in in the first award year, the beginning of program attendance during during the first period, uh, you, you're you're using the category of enrolled. And um, in the second one, the second award year is where you'd be entering either withdrew or graduated. Graduated, and the um, you know there there the built-in expectation uh, if the award year is crossing a summer period that um, or the you know, that the student remains enrolled uh, during that period. This um, next question uh, is, is adds a little bit to what I just said in terms of uh, uh, an expectation 
<clears throat> the student was continuously enrolled during holiday and vacation periods as well as during the summer between academic years and um, the the um, the status of the student would be enrolled uh, on the reporting. So the next one, um, you know, a student was enrolled in a GE program for an award year but did not receive Title IV aid until the subsequent award year. Uh, should the institution report the student is enrolled in the GE program for the first award year, even though no Title IV aid was received? The answer was no. You only report a student beginning with the award year when the student first received Title IV aid. However, when reporting the program attendance, you have the institution would report the date when the student began the program, even if that was in an award year that, um, when the student did not receive aid. The next, the next uh, slide um, addresses the GE reporting on on uh, the finance, some of the financial information. Um, with respect to private loan amounts, it, it is the gross amount of private educational loans received um, for attendance in that GE program. Uh, of course, this is only being reported for the students who graduated or withdrew from the program. Uh, if the student was simply enrolled in that award year, it would be blank. Um, and with respect to the institutional debt, that is the total amount of institutional debt owed by the student for attendance you know, in the program as of the day the student graduated or withdrew, um, not just from the award year being reported. And we will, that, that as we'll see on another slide, <clears throat> that can include more items than you might otherwise think. Um, and the next slide uh, begins to address this point. Um, you know, the question here is how should we report the amount of private loans and institutional debt for a student who was enrolled in more than one educational program at the institution? It's not clear from the question whether this is uh, sequential or, or, or simultaneously in two programs. Um, as the answer indicates, though, the institution must report amounts of private student loans and institutional debt uh, for students who during the award year in question had either withdrawn or completed the program. Uh, it goes on to basically say that you have a choice between how you apply that debt. Um, one option, if they're both GE programs, is uh, to simply take the total amount and divide it equally among the two programs. Uh, the other option is um, to allocate it by program if you have the documentation to be confident uh, with respect to your your allocation by program. Uh, one interesting um, note from this answer, if you have a situation where one program was GE and one was not GE, um, you, then um, the, 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 the institutional debt and, and private student loan information um, would be allocated to the GE program is going to be attributed to it unless you can, in fact, demonstrate that uh, through the documentation how the funds were applied. So if in, in the fourth paragraph, for example, the, their point there was that if, you, if a student took out $20,000 in private loans um, and had documentation that 12000 of that was for the non-GE program, then you would only be reporting 8,000. So, you know, obviously the documentation as to how um, the loans were applied to the programs in question 
can become uh, pretty critical. Um, this question, can the department provide more guidance on institutional debt? Um, and, and as we indicated a minute ago, I mean, it is the amount outstanding as of the date the student completes the program um, or withdraws on any, uh, on any other credit or any other credit, including unpaid charges. Um, so it can include uh, items such as library fees, graduation or withdrawal fees, laboratory fees, etc. Any any amount owed to the institution uh, for tuition fees and institutional charges uh, will be considered institutional debt. And I should say any amount owed after that completion or or withdrawal date. <clears throat> um, the, the next slide, uh, while the Perkins would generally not be um, an item of concern to most institutions, the Perkins Loan Program, it does indicate that amounts owed under Perkins should not be reported as institutional debt. The, the next paragraph is probably a bit more relevant in that over awards and other Title IV student aid owed to the institution including as a result of R2T4, is institutional debt. So, um, and this is continued really in the example probably on the next slide. You know, the, there is um, a circumstance, just to be clear, where, you know, if a student withdraws and you've done an R2T4 calculation, um, at, there's now portion of your tuition which hasn't been paid coupled in this example with a um, there was a gap between the title four and the total cost so there was gap financing and that wasn't fully paid either as of the time the student um, withdrew or completed and so that combined amount, in this case uh, $1,413 of private uh, financing and uh, or, or unpaid tuition that was to be covered by private financing and Title IV is now treated as institutional debt. Um, and, and one of the, um, the thoughts here is to think about on a uh, going forward basis um, really is for institutions to look at their policies with respect to uh, forgiveness um, and, and essentially writing off this debt. Uh, so, you know, if a student completes and still owes $1,400 or if a student withdraws and still owes $1,400, um, the institution could de decide to forgive that amount, in which case, uh, at least from an accounting standpoint, there wouldn't be any debt and presumably no institutional debt here to be reported. Um, this is not something that can be applied with respect to the this thought. It's not something which can be applied with respect to the uh, data being collected now and, and reported because the, the regulation uh, states that it's the <clears throat> institutional debt as of the date of completion. Um, interestingly, the, the, the guidance addresses this point from both a completion and withdrawal standpoint, whereas the regulation only speaks to completion. But, um, you know, for our purposes right now, I think what we're treating them the same. And um, it, it does preclude the ability to write off debt uh, in the current reporting uh, uh, cycle. But it is uh, something which institutions, I think, should think about going forward. Uh, when doing that, you have to, I think, probably look at your, your what allowance do you provide for bad debt? What are your What's your history on collecting debt? You know, what's the effect 
of this policy on your composite score. So there are a number of factors that would come into play here. And I would certainly recommend that, that you um, discuss this with your accountant as well as any attorney. Um, with respect to the reporting of tuition and fee amounts, um, you're reporting the total amount of tuition and fees charged for the entire program, not just the award year, uh, only with respect to graduates or withdrawals uh, for enrolled students in that period it is uh, blank. Um, and importantly, the, the median loan uh, amount will be capped uh, at the total amount charged by the institution for tuition fees, book supplies, and, and equipment. Um, the question here was whether a school could report the amount of tuition and fees remaining on a student's account after scholarships and other non-Title IV aid is applied, uh, thus reducing that, that amount. The answer was no. Uh, school has to report the total amount charged before any aid or other credits such as scholarships are applied. With respect to uh, financial information further as to the allowance for books, supplies, and equipment, it is based upon the uh, amount included in the cost of attendance uh, calculation. Um, and if the institution actually assesses a higher amount than the allowance, you are to report the higher amount. So when you are uh, deciding to package this information and deliver it to the department in one of the few uh, ways that you have to do it, uh, you are provided a little bit of flexibility in terms of uh, what, uh, what kind of organizational structure you're going to use. You're not required to do a, a burst of reporting based on award year or segregate this by uh, single programs. Um, you can basically uh, report the information uh, in in the aggregate to uh, to the extent that the method you choose allows allows you to do so. Um, there are some limitations, as we'll see as we go forward, that uh, you know some of these methods have. Uh, with respect to the size of uh, these you know, submissions of information you're providing to the department at one time. There are you know, essentially two different tracks you can go down. Uh, you are able to uh, get this information to NSLES through batch reporting, uh, and with that option you've got uh, two different you know, formats <coughs> that you can avail yourself of, uh, comma-separated values or fixed-width formats. Uh, the allure of batch reporting is, of course, if you have uh, you know, systems in your uh, your campus management system primarily that you know already has this data in it, you uh, could export that data into one of these two uh, format options and uh, you know send that uh, file uh, through the batch reporting process to NSLDS. Um, obviously, this requires a certain level of uh, sophistication and you need to co uh, coordinate with your IT person, but uh, that is a good option, especially for larger institutions with lots of data to report. Uh, the alternative is to do this uh, through online reporting to NSLDS, and that either is uh, going and doing a record by record uh, direct entry uh, through NSLDS Professional Access a website, or, uh, as you'll see in, in a later slide, you can also submit uh, through NSLDS Online a, a spreadsheet uh, containing this information. But uh, let's talk about batch reporting first. Uh, this is done through uh, the SAIG TG mailbox, which you know, everyone should have. Uh, but you have to make sure that you've uh, configured it properly to make, and that you know, the individual that you've assigned uh, to carry out the reporting process has all the appropriate privileges. Uh, so, you know, that means making sure that you, whoever your institution's primary destination point administrator is, has uh, associated, you know, the user who's your reporter uh, with, you know, uh, 
enrollment updates for online services and that that person is also capable of, of doing batch reporting through NSLDS. Uh, but once you've properly set up uh, the person who's going to be doing this reporting, uh, you, you also uh, can make your decision as to uh, what format CSV are fixed with. And those templates are available uh, on the IFAP website. You've got the link right there. Um, additionally, if you look at the department's uh, published NSLES Gainful Employment User Guide, in Appendix A, uh, the batch file layouts are also provided so you can see exactly you know, how those uh, you know, records are supposed to look in, in either format. Um, in terms of how this really works, it's pretty simple based on this flowchart. Uh, the school will send its batch file uh, via its uh, SAIG TG mailbox, at which point the ball is now in the department's court. Uh, the department will uh, receive that information and should send you back a file that contains the Gainful Employment Error Acknowledgement uh, file uh, for what you've uh, sent to them previously. At that point, the, the activity now is, is yours. Uh, you need to take a look at what the department has uh, said in that uh, error or acknowledgement file. It's either going to be um, an acknowledgement that everything that you reported uh, was accepted and appeared valid, in which case uh, your job is done, or uh, unfortunately that the submission that you uh, provided to the department had some kind of errors uh, in some number of the records, and that file is going to spell out for you what those errors are. It's going to be on you to uh, make a, a supplemental submission to NSLDS correcting those errors. Uh, batch reporting has uh, a, a couple of basic uh, characteristics. You know, there will be a, a header record. Uh, this is you know, going to be the part of your batch report that identifies you know, what the source of the file is and who, who did it and when. Uh, as well as other, you know, identifying information uh, related to the institution. Um, that's the very first thing that will show up on the batch reporting uh, submittal file. Most of that file will be taken up by uh, detailed submittal records, and these are the, you know, the student by student record entries uh, for each award year at each GE program. Uh, you may also uh, have uh, detailed records that are telling NSLDS that you want to uh, update previously submitted records for uh, students or deactivate uh, you know, record types for students. Um, obviously, that's not something that you would have in your initial submission, but as you're do engaging in this back and forth exchange of information with NSLDS, you may realize that uh, you need to have those kinds of, of records as well. Finally, there's going to be a trailer record, and the trailer record really just sums up what you sent. It's going to say, uh, here are the total number of detail records that were in this file. One thing to keep in mind is that when you're batch reporting, you have to be very, very uh, certain that you've formatted your submittal records uh, according to the record layout and the field definitions that appear in Appendix A of that uh, NSLDS Gainful Employment User Manual. Um, you're going to want to Verify this data, do a little QC, and, and see if you can identify formatting errors before submitting this to, net, to net NSLDS. It'll just uh, shorten the amount of work you have to do. When you get the response uh, slash error acknowledgement file, it's going to be organized in a similar way to uh, your submittal file. It's going to have its own header record with the same type of information. Um, it should be a lot shorter, however. The detail records are only going to be those records that relate to uh, students for uh, whom you, ha you had an identified error or, or more than one identified error. In fact, there could be up to five errors listed in your, uh, in your detail records that you get back from the department here. doesn't mean that you can't have more than five mistakes, unfortunately, but uh, the uh, the department's error uh, acknowledgement file is, is just limited in the, in the way that it can only tell you the first five. Uh, again, it will have a trailer record which will show the, the total number of detail records that that format contains. Um, the other point here is that when you get this file and you need to figure out what your error codes mean, you can go to this Appendix A again because those 
error codes will be printed there and you'll be able to identify what NSLDS says the problem was for that uh, student detail record. Um, and again, when you're uh, providing your, your error submittal file back to the department, it's going to be still structured in this you know, three-part way. This is the file that contains the records that you have uh, corrected in response to the department's uh, error uh, submittal file. So, you know, those detail records are going to look very much like what you, you submitted the first time around. It's just you will have changed some piece of information uh, based on what the department told you might have been wrong there. Um, again, just repeating what we said two slides ago, you really need to make sure that you're, you're conforming to the required uh, formatting, you know, principles. And so, you know, it's always a good idea before you try submitting this again to just do one or two uh, checks to, you know, with the uh, field code definitions and format and the user guide to make sure you've done it right. Um, there are some time frames, and these are pretty important when it comes to batch reporting. Obviously, we've already said that you know, as of July 31, that's your, your initial deadline, and the following uh, deadline will come up October 1st for 1415 uh, award year. Um, but after this, you can start just reporting on a rolling basis, meaning you don't have to wait for these deadlines. Um, in fact, the sooner the better for you know, the reasons that are, that are pretty clear on the remainder of this slide. There's you know, a little bit of uh, time that gets eaten up as you go through this back and forth process. Uh, NSLES is, is advising uh, that you know, they should be giving you a uh, error acknowledgement file within 36 hours of you hitting send uh, for your batch submittal file. Um, but if that doesn't happen, uh, you should be getting on the phone and calling NSLDS's customer support center because um, what, what could have occurred is that you may have had some kind of fatal formatting error in which, you know, the uh, NSLDS could not recognize, you know, the batch submittal that you sent, meaning nothing got accepted. And, and in that case, they don't even know that they need to send you an error and acknowledgement file. So the point is, if you don't hear from them within 36, 48 hours of submitting, you need to check in with uh, customer support to see if, if they have any uh, record that what you sent was received, uh, because otherwise you'll just be waiting for an error acknowledgement file that will never come. But assuming that you don't have that problem and uh, that you do get the error acknowledgement file, once you have gone through that and submitted your corrections, um, you have you know, basically uh, 10 days uh, you know, to, to get those errors uh, back. Uh, you know, the department wants to keep this process you know, moving pretty quickly. Obviously, they have quite a bit of data to crunch. Uh, so um, adhere to these time frames, I think it's going to be very important, at least uh, uh, initially as we're going through this for the first time. Now, the alternative to batch reporting is this GE reporting online option. Uh, there, when you sign on to NSLDS uh, Professional Access, uh, you're going to see that there is an entire you know, suite of applications that relate to GE reporting. And the main one for uh, doing your submittal of student records is GE Add. This is a application that allows you to just directly enter this information onto an online form. Um, in order for it to work though, you need to have um, a, uh, an up-to-date web browser and you need to have uh, SSL encryption enabled. Uh, the department recommends that you use um, Microsoft Internet Explorer uh, version 8 or higher. Um, GE Add is uh, a pretty, can be, I guess, a pretty painstaking process if you have a lot of records to get through because you can only do one at a time. Um, but the, one of the virtues of this process, I suppose, is that um, you are going to get, you know, real-time verification that what you've submitted is error-free because as you're filling out that web form, uh, you're going to uh, hit submit and it simply won't allow you to submit if there's some sort of you know, fatal error in one of the fields that you've completed. Um, this is uh, you know, obviously something that you do online and the, uh, 
the website will time you out. Uh, supposedly, if uh, you haven't submitted your record within 30 minutes of inactivity, I would recommend you just based on having uh, to fill out a lot of different federal government web forms over the course of my career, that you not let it go to 30 minutes um, and that you save your work as you go along. Uh, there, You do have the ability to save these records before you submit. Otherwise, you you know, might find yourself uh, frustrated if you get timed out of the website and have to re-enter the, the data again that you previously put in. Uh, there's an app also uh, called GE Submittal, and this is what you're going to use if instead of doing this uh, record by record, you want to use the, a, a spreadsheet to uh, upload multiple records at a time. Uh, you can develop your own template. Uh, however, the department has already provided one, and I, and I believe that, um, well, I know that this is posted on IFAP at the link that we provided here on the slide, but I do believe that uh, Jenny is also going to be making it available along with the, the slide deck for this presentation. Um, so you can go through the spreadsheet uh, and complete the student records that way. Uh, one thing to be aware of, uh, you only have uh, a file size limitation of one megabyte, which is actually a pretty big file for an Excel uh, spreadsheet, but um, this means that you may not be able to do all of your uh, reporting for uh, this first you know, July 31 deadline in one spreadsheet if you have a, a real multitude of records. So keep an eye on what that file size is as you're preparing your spreadsheet because you may need to chop it into multiple spreadsheets. Um, there are additional apps in this GE uh, online uh, suite on NSLDS. Uh, one of them is uh, Social Security Number Conflict. What this tool is for is, is it allows you to see um, what other data providers may have uh, reported the same social security number that you're reporting for a student, except that this it would be a conflict because that same social security number might be uh, assigned to some other person in NSLDS. And when that happens, NSLDS won't let you uh, create or a new record for uh, a student with that same social security number. Uh, so. In that situation, you've got a social security number conflict, and the, uh, the purpose of this tool is to give you information about who that other data provider was that uh, created a record for that social security number so you can contact them to try to resolve it. And now before you do this, I would probably recommend that you uh, double check your own records to make sure that you know what you had uploaded or sent by batch or done through GE reporting online wasn't just the product of a typographical error, but once you ruled that out, you then can go, go ahead and contact you know, the other institution or the loan servicer or whoever is responsible for this number already being an NSLDS. Um, I think that conversation could be a little bit tricky only because of FERPA. Um, the department's you know, encouraging you to use this tool. They're encouraging you to have this conversation, but you know, they don't explicitly give you a uh, a very good uh, exception to FERPA that would allow you to just compare records. Um, as a lot of you probably know, the, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act uh, protects things like social security numbers, which it you know, defines as personally identifying information. So if you've got that kind of information that's, that's based on a student educational record, you can't generally disclose that without prior written consent of the student, and you're not necessarily going to have this here. So how are you going to deal with this conversation with, say, another institution that says a different student owns this social security uh, number? I, mean, I, I guess all I could recommend is you could ask that institution to check their own records for that number uh, and to verify for you that, that they have a, a valid basis for uh, you know, inputting it the way they did. And you know this would get to you know if they had done a, a simple data entry error on their on their end. Uh, beyond that, you know I, I think um, there is a exception to FERPA in the regs at 99.31 that applies to um, you know performing financial aid duties, but it, that you know, doesn't completely uh, fit this situation only because it see, the way it's written it tends to. Uh, be made for the process of packaging a student or um, determining eligibility. And here, you know, it's not really clear that that's what we're doing. What we're really doing is is uh, program compliance. But 
if you had to make a good faith argument on the, on the basis of that exemption, I think you probably could. But it's best to try to resolve it without um, asking an institution to provide you with a record. Um, and also, when you're on the receiving end of a call like that, not to, not to provide a record yourself, but to instead promise that you'll check to see if you think you did it right. Um, GE List is another one of these applications. Um, it does what it says, sounds like it does. It gives you a list of all the records that have been loaded into NSLDS for GE reporting. Uh, GE Detail uh, allows you to view a detailed history of a student's enrollment status. So you can see all the GE reporting that's linked to that student. Uh, finally, GE Update uh, is uh, uh, an app that allows you to uh, select a student to change some GE information. And you can search for students uh, based on name, social security number, school ID, or, or status. Um, this can be helpful when you realize that there are errors that you're looking to fix in your reporting. Um, you have uh, an app called GED Activate also available to you. Uh, this is something that allows the uh, school to deactivate a GE record when the record contains uh, certain errors. We're going to talk a little bit about you know, errors and corrections in just a little bit, but um, you, the reason for deactivate is that once a, a record is loaded into NSLDS, it's pretty much written in stone. You can't delete it, but you can deactivate it. So that's the purpose of this tool. Um, you can also deactivate more than one record at a time, and, and that's what Mass Update and Deactivate uh, does. And we talked a little bit about uh, using um, batch and, and spreadsheets for that purpose. Uh, finally, there's a help tool uh, that uh, you can find on any page that you happen to be on in NSLDS uh, you know, online that uh, should contain some helpful inf information for allowing you to navigate um, the site and this you know, reporting process for online. Uh, these next couple of slides are really just uh, an illustration of what you know adding records online lo looks like. Uh, so as you can see, it's a web form. You know this highlighted box down here is is what you would not successfully be able to click on and complete if you had an error. Um, I, again, when we talked about batch reporting, uh, we mentioned that that was probably a good thing for um, large schools with lots of students and sophisticated you know. Uh, internal databases. Um, online ad probably works a lot better uh, for smaller, more streamlined schools that have fewer records. Um, you know, it, 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 one way that you can be sure you're doing your reporting on time and right uh, is through online ads since you'll know instantly whether your results were accepted um, and you can fix your errors uh, in real time too without you know, that having this lag time uh, that you have for batch processing. Uh, when you are uh, using the submittal spreadsheet, um, obviously this uh, allows you to add multiple records at once. Uh, you, can, you can do it uh, reporting for more than one award year at a time. Uh, it's submitted online. You, you basically upload the spreadsheet once you're logged in to NSLDS. And there is a, um, a, a validate data option. So there's a tool to let you know, again, uh, whether or not you're going to have errors. Uh, so another way of, of dealing with the process of you know, quality control or getting it right. Um, and as we get closer to uh, July 31 um, and we have less time to, to get this in, um, not having to wait around for uh, the back and forth of batch files, particularly if you're a size of school that doesn't need to rely on them, uh, this might be a, a quicker way to get through the process. Um, I guess I've said everything on this slide already. Here again are some just visual aids. This is uh, what the spreadsheet would look like when it look like when it's completed. So you can see here uh, just what the the basic record format looks like. Um, finally, there are uh, some additional tools uh, that you can leverage when you're uh, logged on to you know, GE uh, online reporting, which is uh, you can create a, uh, an extract file record uh, called uh, GenX1. And I guess I would compare this somewhat to uh, the uh, student uh, borrower uh, extracts that you can run on NSLDS when you're trying to figure out what your cohort default rates are. 
you know, this is, uh, like those reports, a report of uh, all of this GE uh, record information that, you know, is, is in NSLDS for students at your institution, um, which should, you know, allow you to have a sense of what you think your cohort is going to be for uh, the debt to earnings information. And I, and I think it, it probably also um, might be useful for other, you know, purposes of, you know, trying to uh, figure out, uh, you know, what, what the um, possibility or, or or how reasonably easy or difficult it would be to do an alternative earnings survey because you could immediately have a list of all the students that you'd have to go try to find earnings information from them or their employers. Um, this tool maybe has other applications beyond what I've discussed because it really does uh, show you all the data in, in a number of different ways. Um, so uh, it, it's a tool I would encourage you to try to get some uh, familiar with. Um, you can also, you know, when I see uh, the, those records individually online going through the GE list applications. So there really are, you know, two ways to try to poke around and, and get a sense of, of what is now going to be an NSLDS uh, based on GE reporting you've done. Uh, a couple of things we wanted to bring to your attention uh, uh, that are already being identified as, as common problems. Um, we mentioned this before, you know, having some sort of uh, departure in the format for the batch files you submit that causes you not to receive an error acknowledgement file. Um, again, just don't sleep. Once you've submitted a batch file, don't sleep on it. If you haven't heard from the department, check with NSLDS and try to figure out what's happened because they could, I, I think what they would do in this troubleshooting would be to take a look at um, how you structured your, your batch file to identify maybe what the problem was. Um, but it, it might not just be that you made an error in terms of how you put it together. There may have been, you know, some kind of security problem uh, when it was submitted. Uh, the department systems looking for, um, you know, malicious activity from hackers may have, you know, mistakenly thought that you were somehow a threat and not allowed NSLDS to accept your file. Um, there may have been just any one of those kinds of snafus that can happen uh, when you're doing a large file transfer. Uh, the, you know, the information sometimes just like a cell phone call can get dropped, which can lead to errors in transmission. So, uh, you know, those are the big three, security, transmission, and, and the, the file layout issues. Um, as far as, you know, the, the information that can lead, that can be in your submittals that can lead to errors, um, you, you want to, again, make sure that you're using the proper version of the SIP. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you've uh, formatted your, your date fields correctly. Um, and you're going to um, have the opportunity to, you know, update information when you do recognize that there are problems. Um, you have multiple ways uh, that we've talked about to, to get this done. Um, Keep in mind that um, you may have multiple things you need to fix. So one of one or more of these methods might be you know more appropriate than others. You know, a mass update deactivate is only going to be able to fix a certain class of uh, of error correction. If you've got a particular student record with a lot of problems, uh, you might have to just go in and fix it uh, through a single record update. Um, the difference between what we call errors and corrections are that, um, you know, an, an error, uh, are, errors are things, I guess, that, you know, prevent records from actually making it in uh, to NSLDS. Um, you know, they, they, are, they are errors that either bounce back to you uh, through the batch uh, acknowledgement uh, process or, you know, prevent you from submitting it and getting it accepted into NSLDS. Um, corrections are for records that are actually already on NS NSLDS. For instance, if you figured out that you uh, created a, a record for a student um, and you entered in uh, information that indicated the student graduated in, uh, in an award year and he actually graduated in a later award year, you'd have to go in and, and correct that record. Um, if you are talking about uh, updating records that are um, part of the same award year, you're able to do this through the online process, um, specifically if you have um, changes that are going to be made to a social security number, to the institutional OPID, 
to SIP code or to credential level. Um, however, if, if it's the award year itself that you need to change, you're, you can't really change that. Uh, you're going to have to just deactivate that record and, and start over with a new one to correct award year. Um, similarly, you can do the same kinds of updates through batch. Um, and this, uh, this slide uh, creates a, or provides you with an example. I know that we're getting a little short, short on time and we want to get to your questions, so I'll just uh, highlight this for you and, and we'll move um, to, uh, to the closing part here. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think Steve's right. We're a little over and we do have, uh, as I understand it, a number of questions. So uh, you know, this slide does set forth a few uh, thoughts on, uh, on, on compliance with this reporting requirement on a going forward basis. Uh, you know, developing an internal system to collect and store the required information. I think evaluating whether the program um, SIP and related SOC codes are accurate on a going forward basis uh, tied to the next bullet uh, so that you don't have programs to just sitting on your um, eCar which uh, are not active. Uh, obviously, new programs uh, need to be added if appropriate, uh, so long as you're not precluded from doing so based on the substantially similar analysis. Um, you know, beginning a, a, employment, a graduate employment survey process uh, may turn into a, an important uh, basis for appeals, uh, if, and, and uh, the department is supposed to come out with a guidance with respect to that. They haven't as yet. Um, this certainly, this reflects basic information that you would want to be collecting uh, for at least the four years after graduation. Um, and obviously having a process, uh, you know, for, for regularly reviewing your disclosures and your policies and procedures. So um, I think with that, let me look at the last slide. Um, yeah, that's simply... If you haven't listened to the department's webinars on reporting, which are posted, um, the, the, two, the two there are uh, basically one, one webinar. Um, I would uh, highly recommend doing that. Um, there was a lot of useful information in, in those webinars. Um, and obviously these user guides and instruction guides and templates, suggested templates, are on the um, IFAF webpage. So, Jenny, I, I think with that, um, maybe we can turn to questions for a few minutes. Sure, perfect. So, uh, before I start with the questions, I did get a lot of people asking about the PDF of the presentation. I have put it in the handout section, which should be near where you ask your questions. And you should be able to download it there along with the Excel sheet that Steve spoke about earlier. Um, if you can't get it there, I have it up on our website and you can download it from our website. Otherwise, you'll be getting the email tomorrow with it. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and start the questions. Uh, we do have several of them. Uh, so Peter and Steve, our first question is, when you say same six-digit OPEID and the same zip code, would you count it as one GE program if they are different branches under the same OPEID? Uh, yes. <laughs> that, that really is the effect of, uh, of, having, of using that one OPE number. It brings the additional locations or branches in so that the, the metrics or the data is, is as to one program for the entire group. Perfect. Uh, can we correct the SIP codes after July 1? Uh, yes. Steve, do you agree? Definitely. I mean, you have the opportunity to uh, correct those entries and either using any of those methods I've described in the, in the presentation, but 
I, I also think that you need to pay attention to the zip code that you might have on your um, electronic application or e-car as well. If you've got um, your program listed there, obviously if it's a degree program, you might not have it listed, but you want to make sure that uh, the zip code there matches um, what you're reporting in, in MSLDS. But in all cases, if you're aware of a mistake, uh, go ahead and fix it. Great. So we are in the middle of teaching out an educational program, and it will be done by November 2015. The program was open in November 2012. Do we need to report this program? Uh, yes. Yes, because it was you know in existence uh, as of you know July 1st of 2015. Understanding you know it's being phased out, but that is uh, the line. Okay. Uh, regarding institutional debt, if a return to Title IV has not been done yet, how do you report what is owed as of the LDA, assuming the return will be done within 45 days? Um, well, the, 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 the determination of the debt is as of the date the student completed or or and, and or were withdrew. Now we it's not really clear to us whether it would be the LDA date or whether it might be your date of determination. Um, so, but if you haven't made that determination yet, um, by the time you report to the Department. Um, hmm. I got my 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 inclination is to is to ex make the effort to make the determination beforehand. I I, I don't uh, feel personally comfortable with the idea of just holding that back because you have that window, but there is a basis there. I don't know. Steve, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Peter. I think you have to report. Uh, what you know, um, you know the the question that maybe is still open in my mind <laughs> is whether you have an affirmative duty to to update it after you've reported it, you know, within that 45 day period. Because at some point after reporting it, you'll know. Uh, what well, that's true. You know, that that's true. It does fit into that whole discussion you had about correcting data. Yeah. So if you were to not report it now because the reporting date comes before the determination of uh, the institutional debt um, and then you figured out what the debt is you know two weeks later um, that ends up being required reporting yeah I, I think that's right okay next question uh, if a school offers Pell only and no government loans but has the student make payments throughout the program. If there is a balance due past the graduation date, is that is this to be reported as institutional debt? Uh, yes, I think it would be. Uh, that's, that's that's money owed after completion or or grad or withdrawal. Great. Um, next question: What is the first Award year. They, the, the, the other qualifying factor here is that the um, you know this is a student for whom you do have to report because the student received Title IV aid. Okay. Uh, what is the first award year being used to pass zone fail a program? It's the, the one ending next week, uh, the 1415 award year. Yep. Uh, if you write off debt, can that be considered tuition discounting? If you adopt this practice, would you not then have to write off debt for all students in that program? 
Um, well, that would become a factor that I think you would have to evaluate here. I mean, uh, you know, when I uh, threw out that idea, um, it, I wasn't suggesting you would only be doing it for you know a, a particular student here or there. Uh, I was thinking about it as a you know that the institution might have to consider uh, adopting a policy. Um, that addresses this issue as of the completion date. OK. Um, another question about a school who is performing a teach out of one of its programs. So I think we already heard the answer, but I'll ask it again. Is it still necessary to report data for that program students for the previous year or years? Steve? Yeah, we, we believe it is. Um, you know, if, if the program is still in existence as, uh, on July 1st. Okay. Uh, we have a new GE program that started in the 2013-15 award year. Our first class completed in the 2014-15 award year. Are we required to report the 2013-14 if we didn't have any completers? Yeah, as Steve said, I mean, it's as of July 1st, the GE programs, but you won't be reporting any completers. And, um, you know, the department's not going to be able to calculate any metric uh, on on uh, that group to initially. Um, next question. I think you guys cover this already, but I'll ask it. Are we able to submit a draft basis to test our errors before it is an official submission? Well, you, you could. It depends on how you want to give the department the data, I suppose. Um, you, you wouldn't be able to do that through batch, but through the spreadsheet, you could use the, you know, the validation tool before it's submitted to uh, check for errors. Uh, certainly, if you were doing a record by record, you know, online ad, that's exactly what you would be doing. Okay. Is the reporting date of July 31st for the initial file submittals and not any error records, or is it for both? That is a very good question. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, I'd have to maybe try to research what the department has said about this deadline. Um, and maybe, Jenny, I could email you uh, what I found. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, if you want, you can email it me, and I will email it to all the attendees, because I, I agree that's a very good question. So with that said, we'll go on to the next one. Can the data be sent in multiple batches for the same award year? Yes, uh, you're you're able to do that. Um, you know the department really doesn't uh, limit you in any way. Uh, you know in terms of segregating by program or by award year. So if you uh, if you had two batches for the same award year, that's just fine. When we report students twice due to their enrollment rolling over two award years, is the tuition and fees reported twice, or should we split the fees in half? You're reporting the tuition and fees for the entire program uh, in each instance. Uh, you know, it's going to, the department, we hope, would know this. Uh, you know, it's their rule. Uh, so, you know, I don't think there's a danger that they're going to double the fees for that student. You know, they're looking at, uh, you know, that uh, that piece of information is, is supposed to be uh, for the program. So it, you're going to have it in NSLDS multiple times on each entry that you that you fill out. Yeah, they're only going to be using the data at this point in time for the... Uh, students who complete or withdraw. So presumably that's the only one that really becomes relevant. Okay. 
Yeah, and that tuition and fees, you know, information is really, you know, the that that ceiling that they imposed on, um, you know, the the costs that go into calculating an annual loan payment. So, um, you know, it, it it's not something that they they need to add or subtract to anything. It's it's, you know, a a uh, maximum amount of loan debt that they're willing to recognize. Okay, next question. Uh, if we offered a nine month HAVAC program until we taught it out in 2013, but then began offering it again in uh, 2013, a, a 10 month HAVAC program until present time, do we still report on the taught out nine month program? Probably not. You know, it depends on on what they what the you know writer means by having taught out the program. If they uh, ceased enrollment, let all of the students who were enrolled uh, in that initial nine month program uh, finish the program, or you know, if they dropped out, they dropped out, and then they reported to the department, uh, their their accreditor and their state regulator that you know they had ceased offering that program, then. I think that that, pro that part of the program doesn't uh, need to get reported because it's, it's not a GE program that's still in existence. But if they, if they just taught it out uh, by, you know, not enrolling, by taking a hiatus for a year or more in enrollments, but they, as far as all of the regulators were concerned, this was still an approved program, then I think, you know, those prior periods of 2013 and so on, do need to get picked up because as far as the department is concerned, that program, even if you didn't have any students enrolled at the time, was still an approved program and it is today as well. Okay. Uh, can you edit a record after you have submitted it via the NSLDS website? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, but keep in mind, if, if what you're hoping to change is the award year, then uh, you have to instead deactivate it. Okay. Um, we have another question about do all the errors have to be resolved by July 31st or just submitted? So we will find that out. Does the Gen X1 tool work now or after we submit? I think I, mean, I, I haven't been able to run that report. Uh, you know, I haven't tried to do it, and I, you know, since I don't work uh, at a school, I don't have access to NSL to, to try to do it. But um, you know, I, I think the department has turned it on, so it would just report back whenever it was in NSLDS. If your school hasn't reported anything yet, I think you'd probably get uh, an empty report. But uh, it should you know, just give you the information that is in NSLDS. So uh, I, I think you I think you would be able to do it now. I haven't actually seen anybody do it, uh, but uh, I believe that it's, it's operable. Okay. If a school purchases an additional location, they would only have to start reporting from the time they purchased the school, correct? No. I mean, it's still a. Um, first of all, if the if the if it's an additional location, then it's going to be part of that pre-existing main OPE number, and then we're still talking about looking at the list of approved programs as of July first for the institution. So I think it would still. I think. And I don't see that as necessarily affecting the uh, this reporting requirement. Okay. What are nonprofit schools required to report? Um, nonprofit schools uh, have a, a, a different, um, you know, a di different definitions for program eligibility apply to them, and as a result. Uh, the, their, G, their GE programs uh, are uh, programs that are uh, certificate or diploma uh, programs. 
uh, if you're a nonprofit institution, you do not have to report uh, uh, degree programs. Uh, there's a third category of program called transfer programs, and those have to be uh, programs that are uh, at least two years in length and fully accepted for um, tr uh, you know, transfer credit into a bachelor's degree program. That's four years. Um, but the other thing uh, they, those transfer programs have to include is that the institution cannot actually uh, provide any credential to a student who completes the transfer program. All they get is that transfer credit. If you are giving them a diploma or a certificate, then it's a GE program because the department's going to say that that's not a transfer program. It's a certificate or a diploma program. Okay. Um, someone asked if they can get a copy of the questions and answers of the webinar. Uh, I will work to try to put that together and get that out to people. Uh, so next question, when you report on a program, is it a requirement for there to be 30 students or more enrolled in the program? Yeah, you're, you're reporting for um, every student who's enrolled in a GE program. Uh, so you don't, uh, you would be reporting, you know, if you only had 20 students, you'd have to report them still. It's just the department would, would know um, that it couldn't calculate a rate because the cohort size, you know, would be below 30. Uh, but obviously the department can't make that determination if they don't know how many students were in the program to begin with, and that's the information you need to give them. Do nonprofit organizations need to report GE for AAS degree granting programs? Um, academic associate degree programs are, are degree programs as, uh, as far as the department is concerned, and so therefore they're going to fall into that category of uh, degree programs, and therefore uh, they will not be gainful employment programs. It looks like we just have uh, three more questions. So, is there any information on what an alternative earnings survey would entail? Not yet. Yeah, it's pretty sketchy. Um, the department has promised that uh, NCES is going to deliver a survey tool that any school can use. Um, at the moment, that, that tool doesn't exist. And so we're all kind of waiting to see uh, what it's going to look like. You know, ultimately, you wouldn't have to use that survey tool. The requirement would be that you uh, use a survey that you know meets NCES standards. But you know, clearly, the easiest way to do that is to use the tool. Um, and we also know that um, even though we don't have the tool, that you would need to have a response rate of more than 50 percent. Uh, of of the uh, you know students you're surveying, and you would have to uh, have a cohort group of at least 30. So you need 30 30 responses and and or more, and you need to have you know 51 percent or more of that of that cohort group return the survey. All right, and so this will be the final question. If you have a diploma program with tuition fees and then the student has the opportunity to continue into an associate program with the same SIP code, will additional tuition fees, with additional tuition fees, will the tuition be split between the two programs or will they be combined based on the associate level completer in the program? Yeah, the, the regulation says that it'll be attributed to the higher level program. Um, unlike that example we went over where there was a discussion of, of two programs at the same level, they didn't really address um, this other situation um, any more concretely uh, than what is in the, the regulation itself. So, you know, my understanding, I don't know, Steve may have a different one. My understanding right now is that you would attribute the, the, all of that debt um, to the higher level degree program. 
well, our program. I think you know there's there's a factor here that's really critical to analyzing this, which is from the student from the school's perspective, what programs is the student enrolled in? I mean, the way the question sounded to me, uh, it, it wasn't clear whether what we're talking about is a student who begins in in one program, completes it, and then enrolls in another, or whether there's the student is dually enrolled in two programs from the beginning. And so your responsibilities for reporting are going to be a little bit different based on that. And um, obviously, you know, the attribution of, of loan debt uh, role um, you know, goes, is squarely for, you know, applies, as Peter says, uh, to, you know, situations where you've got, a, you know, two GE programs and, and one with a higher credential level. But, um, you know, you, you, have to, you have to know whether or not, uh, the student is really in, enrolled in, in two programs to begin with before you can be sure what the right answer is there. Okay. Um, so, you know, we've gone a little bit over, so I'm going to end it here. If we didn't answer your question, if I happen to miss it, please send me an email and we will get it answered. Also, I'll look into seeing if we can get these uh, questions and answers are written out and sent out to everyone also. So with that, I just want to thank uh, Peter and Steve again for taking the time to talk to us today. And um, if anyone has any questions, just send me an email or call me and I'll be happy to answer those for you. So with right. that, um, we'll go ahead and end the webinar. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Thanks. Good job, guys.